The world's canines are a mix of wolves, jackals, fox, coyotes, and other members of the dog family. But like human relatives, they don't necessarily get along. That's especially true of foxes and coyotes that are moving into urban areas in increasing numbers. In 2019, University of Minnesota researchers started looking at the behaviors of fox and coyotes establishing their home ranges in the Twin Cities seven county metropolitan area. We really wanted to get an idea of how these species are moving throughout urban landscapes and then also get an idea of what kind of diseases these animals are carrying, what they're eating, and also get kind of a sense for where hot spots for risk of conflict between human and humans and wildlife are in the metro. Foxes often den under decks, under people's houses, where we don't see that with coyotes at all. This is partially due to the foxes selecting areas where they can avoid running into coyotes because coyotes do pose a immediate risk to the life of any fox they run into. When a coyote kills a fox, it's typically what we call a competition killing. So they're not actually killing the fox to eat the fox. They're concerned about foxes eating more of the rabbits and squirrels that they might be eating. What we see with coyotes is they seem to select more of the green spaces. And so they'll try to avoid people and their avoidance in these green spaces kind of gives an opportunity to foxes to get away from coyotes in the more heavily human-used landscapes. To study the wild canines, Jeff Miller started capturing and collaring them in the fall of 2019. Last October, he showed us a trap site. This is close to downtown Minneapolis. We caught a gray fox just like 20 yards that way. We know that there's a red fox and a coyote in this area as well. So we've got all three canines right across from downtown. In this case, we're using a dirt hole set with a foothold trap and to make sure that we're not catching any domestic animals in the set. We actually cover just with a bucket lid during the day and a rock so that even if somebody's dog finds it, they shouldn't be able to get this cover off of the trap. And then we also use other methods of trapping such as cable restraints. And with those, you just simply close the loop that the animal would get caught in. We do that during the day to close them down. And we also use box traps occasionally that's just simply closing down the trap. The trap is actually buried right here and there's a hole down that way with uh, a little bit of bait and a lure and that's how we attract the animal to this area. Canines are really intrigued by holes and they'll come and investigate. It does attract quite a variety of carnivores so you'll get raccoons in urban settings you also get the occasional opossum. Dogs are really attracted to these uh, sites as well, but we take all precautions to make sure that we do not catch any domestic animals in our traps. So wherever we have a trap out in a public area, we will make sure there are signs posted so that people know that there's wildlife research going on in the area. Once we get a animal in a live trap, we'll tranquilize it. During the processing, we'll put a GPS collar on the animal. We'll take a blood sample. We'll check for different diseases. It'll be about 45 minutes total that the animal is totally under, under anesthesia. And after about 45 minutes of recovering, that's typically when an animal is released. We take hair samples and through measuring different isotopic signatures in hair samples, we can actually determine how much human food the animal has been 
incorporating in its diet. And then we also take fecal samples to test for different internal parasitic diseases, so intestinal parasites. In urban environments, you have less habitat, less of these selected habitats, such as green spaces, wooded areas, grassy areas, where these species can actually go. So when they're confined to these smaller green spaces, they're more likely to come in contact with each other and more likely to spread the diseases. Over two seasons, researchers caught and collared 16 red and two gray foxes and 17 coyotes. We checked back with Jeff in April to see what the study analyses had shown so far. One of the surprising things that we found was actually how low the survivorship is for red foxes compared to coyotes. We were finding that about 80% of the coyotes that we collared will survive from one, one year to the next, whereas red foxes have a really low survivorship actually. So they have around 20% of the population will survive from one year to the next. Foxes seem to be getting mange at a higher rate than coyotes are. From 17 foxes, it looks like four or five um, of those animals are then gonna have mange. Mange is actually a small mite that lives on these animals. It burrows into the hair follicles of the animal and that's what causes the really uh, really dramatic hair loss and scabbing that you see in these animals. It's a really communicable disease so it spreads pretty rapidly throughout these populations and can have a pretty detrimental impact on on the populations themselves. Two of the red foxes that we collared that were killed by coyotes had mange in some form so that could have contributed to them being less mobile and then being caught by a coyote and also we've had one of the one of the foxes with mange got hit by a car um, so mange has the potential to alter their behaviors in ways that it makes them more likely to die either directly from mange or as a secondary result of mange The study also tested for coronavirus, but none showed up. However, 90% of the metro animals have, or in the past have had, canine parvovirus or distemper. We asked Jeff how the increased presence of these animals could impact urban residents, particularly coyotes, that many call varmints. Coyotes do have this kind of reputation of being mean, but I think that's just kind of a bad reputation that coyotes have in general. As humans, we try to we sometimes conflate intelligence because intelligent animals can be more of a nuisance with being a bad animal. You may think your dog is smart and dogs evolved from wolves, but coyotes actually have a higher brain mass ratio to body weight than wolves do, so they're highly intelligent animals. Any carnivore is that's intelligent is gonna cause potential for problems with pets, especially in the spring when coyotes are denning. They want to protect their young from run-ins with other canines, because in the wild, another canine might be a wolf that would try to kill their young. The bolder a coyote is, the more likely it is to get into a confrontation with a human. And so feeding wildlife is one thing that should really be avoided. When you see a coyote that's acting bold, you should yell at that coyote and teach it that coming into contact with a person is not a thing they should want to do. Throwing things at coyotes, yelling at them, making yourself look big, and basically showing them that you're the, the one in charge in this interaction. And that will actually ensure that the coyotes can live in these landscapes without coming into conflict with humans and their pets. These animals are here to stay. There's really no management solution that will keep coyotes from moving into the cities. One of the things that might make Minneapolis and St. Paul a little different than other metropolitan areas such as Chicago 
is that there's this green space that kind of breaks right through the center of these cities. So the Mississippi River goes right through downtown Minneapolis, down, downtown St. Paul. That really gives these animals an avenue to move through these really urban areas. If we control coyote populations in the cities, they're gonna move back in. We're gonna have to get used to coyotes and foxes being around because both of these animals are throughout these areas. Funding for this program was provided by the Minnesota Environment and Natural Resources Trust Fund, Safe Basements of Minnesota, your basement waterproofing and foundation repair specialist since 1990. Peace of mind is a safe basement. Live wide open. The more people know about West Central Minnesota, the more reasons they have to live here. More at livewideopen.com. Western Minnesota Prairie Waters, where peace, relaxation, and opportunities await.